and I'm, uh, my wife will tell you I'm more than just a little bit deaf in one ear. So if you would, should speak to me afterwards and you're not getting my attention and you're speaking to my left side, it's because I don't know you're there. I'm sorry. <laughs> but uh, the Lord is helping with that and uh, uh, you can pray for more help if you want something to pray about. Uh, a little about my wife and myself, I'll just share a few moments because I don't want to take too much time from the message. But uh, my wife and I have been married 49 years and change. And uh, December 30 this year will make uh, 50 years. And we got married during the oil embargo. Some of you remember that. Okay. And we were afraid that our wedding guests would never be able to make it to the wedding. But I don't want to go into that story. But it's an interesting one. And um, my wife uh, is the daughter of a... Uh, of a minister, but he was a pastor evangelist, and he was a man of note. And uh, she, when he got a call, he just assumed it was from the Lord. He didn't wait and see and check out and see if everything was fine and all like that. He just went. So she's actually lived in 22 states. She's lived in 22 states. And her dad held, held credentials for 56 years before he finally passed. And, um, and then she's been in every state except Alaska and Hawaii. And then when she married me, she thought, oh, she'd never have to move again. Well, we've moved around a little bit. We've moved, I don't know, 13, 14 times, something like that. And um, she's even been abroad with me. She hasn't been abroad to as many places as I have. I've um, had the privilege of uh, working for the church in Somalia back when, during the year leading up to Black Hawk Down. That was interesting. Uh, in charge of ADRA, a uh, uh, project there, and done some other things. I've done everything else under the sun um, uh, for a living, nursing, uh, electrician apprentice, uh, in nursing, I worked for the military in Washington on contract. And uh, so, but God has blessed us. He's protected us. And uh, the message I have for you today, to me, is probably the most important message I could give, that I could give, that the Lord has laid upon me in my life. I've given this message many places in the world. Many places in Western Ukraine, every conference in Romania, many places in Russia, Mongolia, Australia, Botswana, uh, camp meeting here, things of that nature. And it's a message that we need to look at very seriously. October, for those of you who, you know, do well with numbers, October 22, 1844, was how many years ago? Quick. Come on, you guys. Somebody out there is good in math. Come on. It was 178 years, and this coming October 22, it'll be 179 years, right? Correct? That's almost 200 years after 1844. Our forefathers, our leaders, Ellen White and others, believed Jesus would come soon in their day, and they had every reason to expect it because it was supposed to happen soon after 1844. Amen? Okay. Well, if it was supposed to happen soon after 1844, and it didn't happen, who's at fault? God or us? Today, I'm going to speak to you from my heart, from the word of Ellen White, from Scripture, so that you'll know where we went wrong, what we didn't do, what we're still not doing as a church, and what we're doing that's actually blocking the way for Jesus to come. And then when we fix this problem, we're promised myriads of angels to assist us. The angels do not preach the gospel to humanity, do they? No. They don't preach the gospel to humanity. 
You and I share the gospel. Preach. I use the word preach. It, okay, just because that's for terms. But you share with your neighbors the gospel. And when you're doing that, God releases angels to assist you. God releases angels to assist you. You want a helper? You want extra angels to, to be with you? Start doing what you're supposed to do. You like that? Okay, there's a, there's a couple of slides I'm going to slip across and uh, for time, but we're going to talk about that. I'm going to, just a moment here. Okay, let's just make sure I do this right. There we go. All right. We're going to talk about new churches in darkness. We've been, how many, how many, of, you, how many of you have been a lifelong Adventist? Okay, okay. During your lifetime, have you seen all these places around us receive an effort to plant a new church? Yes or no? You haven't, have you? All the towns around, nearby? You haven't seen it, have you? Neither have I. So I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but you can see where I'm going. Now, in Ellen White's day, they read a lot of prophecies. One of the ones has to do with, there's a lot of sevens in, in Bible prophecy, correct? In, in Revelation, lots of sevens. But you have the seven trumpets, you have the seven churches, you have the sevens, all like that. When you get down to the sevens, you're at the end of everything, aren't you? Because it doesn't go to eight, okay? So a trumpet, now even in, among Adventist theologians, there's not 100% full agreement on everything about the trumpets. But one thing that they're all, they all agree upon is that they're warnings. They're warnings. They're calls to action and they're warnings. So in Revelation 11 and verse 15, we find uh, the seventh angel here. The seventh angel sounded... And there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Does this sound like you're getting close to the end of time? You know, it's okay if you say yes. Don't just sit there and do like this. Okay, we can, come on, we can do more than that, right? Okay? You're not dead out there. I'm, I'm going to call 911. It's okay. It sounds like we're getting close to the end, doesn't it? That sounds like it's, okay, the kingdoms, it, it sounds like it's already happened almost. Move forward nine verse, excuse me, four verses to Revelation 11, 19. And the temple of God was opened in heaven. When we talk about the temple opening in heaven, we're talking about the last day judgment, correct? We're talking about the judgment that's going on in heaven even as we speak. And the temple of God, of God was open in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testimony. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. It sounds like last events tied in with the time of the last day judgment of all mankind. Now let's see what Ellen White says. I love the writings of Ellen White. They're so wonderful. They help somebody like me to make sense out of some things, okay? We're supposed to study our Bibles, but if you'd like some really good help, it won't hurt you to turn to Spirit of Prophecy, okay? Let's go to Great Controversy. The Temple of God, and this is from page 433. The Temple of God it was opened in heaven, and there was seen... One moment. And there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, Revelation eleven nineteen. The ark of God's testament is in the Holy of Holies, the second apartment of the sanctuary. Are we following along clearly now? We know what we're talking about, okay? In the administration of the earthly tabernacle, which served under the example and shadow of heavenly things, the apartment was opened only on the great day of atonement for the cleansing of the sanctuary. Therefore, the announcement that the temple of God was opened in heaven and the ark of his testament was seen points to the opening of the most holy place in the heavenly sanctuary 
in 1844 as Christ entered there to perform the closing work of his atonement. So it's 1844. We're talking, we're talking our time that we're living in. From the time of 1844 onward, we're, we're in the same time period. Nothing has advanced. So the 1844, the antitypical day of atonement, the judgment, seventh trumpet, it's all one and the same thing. But now, back in Revelation 10, there is something which if our forefathers had understood this correctly, if they had understood this correctly, things might have been different. Okay? Maybe we wouldn't still be here today. Maybe we would have already been in heaven. Maybe you and I would not have been born. Please understand that if our forefathers had done their job as God expected them to, you and I would not have been born, neither would our parents, and perhaps not our grandparents either. Revelation 10, 7, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound. So we're talking about close to 1844, correct? The seventh angel started sounding in 1844. It says, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared unto his servants the prophets. So what on earth is this mystery of God that the Bible says would be finished? It says should be finished. Shortly after the trumpet began to sound, what is that mystery of God? So I thought, all right, I might have to check this out. Look it up. What is that mystery? Well, Ephesians 3 and some writings of Paul will help us here. Ephesians 3 tells us, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. He's about to tell you what the mystery is. As I wrote afore in a few words, whereby when you read, you might understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. And here it is that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Would you agree with me that to the Jews in that day, it was a mystery that the Gentiles should be saved? Okay? And when Christ came, after Christ came, there was a time to reveal that, and the mystery was then opened. Okay? So the mystery of God that should have been finished soon after 1844, was what? The evangelization of the entire world, correct? Does that seem reasonable? Okay, uh, Colossians 3 tells us this. With all praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bonds. Why was Paul in bonds? It is because he was sharing the gospel with people that didn't know it. As far as he could go in his lifetime around the world to places where there were no churches, there were no Jews, there, were no, there was no knowledge of Christ. That's where Paul spent his time. Did Paul and Timothy, like our pastors today, spend all their time taking care of the people that already know the truth. They didn't. They didn't. Okay? So now, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound... The mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared unto his servants the prophets. That word finished there. I want to tell you something about Greek, okay? I can tell you something, and you can tell by the tone of my voice what I mean, okay? Like well, I can say, sure, I'll go. That means I'm going to go. 
Or I can say, sure, I'll go. I just told you two different things, didn't I? Sure, I'll go. Or I can say, sure, I'll go. But in Greek, instead of saying it with a little tone in your voice to indicate what you mean, you can tell by the way they spell the word exactly what it means. You see, Greek in the Bible had to, had, to, had to still be around all these hundreds and thousands of years and still say the same thing. That's why preachers study Greek, because you can tell by the way a word is spelled exactly what the speaker meant, precisely. So what does that word finished mean? Well, it, the word there, uh, obviously the prophecy wasn't at the correct time. Why? Well, that word should be finished. It's written in something that's called the subjunctive mood. The subjunctive mood is the mood of possibility and potentiality. The action described may or may not occur depending upon circumstances. Okay, so it's called conditional prophecy. Well, we have other illustrations, but even in Hebrew, about conditional prophecy. The destruction of Jonah. Jonah was supposed to say 40 days, guys, and, and, and you're going to be destroyed. And then Jonah was upset because he knew that God wouldn't destroy him if they, if they he hated them. And he really didn't want to give them the warning because he knew that after he told them they were going to be destroyed, if they were to repent, God would, 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 it was a conditional prophecy that God would not destroy them. So there's, uh, there's other places in Scripture other than that. And so Desire of Ages, page 633, you know when you read through some of these things in Spirit of Prophecy, they kind of, come, they kind of go over the top. But when I was doing research for this, and, and I've got a book out on it, and you can download it for free. Just go to letmypastorsgo.com. You can download it for free. Letmypastorsgo.com. Letmypastors, plural, go.com. Well, let's go through this. God hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world. Acts 17.33, Christ tells us when that day shall be ushered in. He does not say that all of the world will be converted, but that this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. If Christ were to come one minute sooner, and there was somebody that had not received a warning, the devil could say, you weren't fair. You didn't give them an opportunity. Everyone has to have the, the opportunity for what we call the first right of refusal. Will most people accept it? No. But there are still those out there in towns all around here who haven't heard our message yet, And some of them will accept it. Some of them will even become missionaries. By giving the gospel to the world, and get, this one, you've got to look at this carefully. By giving the gospel to the world, it is in our power to hasten our Lord's return. Are you tired of living in a sinful world? You can change it. Jesus can come as fast as you and I want him to if we're willing to do something about it. By giving the gospel to the world, it is in our power to hasten our Lord's return. We are not only to look for, but to hasten the coming of the day of God, 2 Peter 3, 12. Had, now look, Ellen White was born November 26, 1827. Okay? And uh, this is Desire of Ages. It was published in 1898. Okay, so she was an older lady by this time. Okay? She would have been uh, 71 years old when this was published, if, I'm, if my math is correct. If my math is wrong, please forgive me. Someone correct me. But anyway. Had the Church of Christ done her appointed work as the Lord ordained the whole world before this, 
would have been warned, and the Lord Jesus would have come to our earth in power and great glory because Matthew 24, 14 has to be fulfilled, period. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached. That's not, you know, subjunctive. Shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then... And only then, I might add, shall the end come. So the question is, you know, who have we been preaching to? You know, from 1844 until now, it's 100 and almost 179 years. And throughout much of this time, especially in our day, um, we've been preaching. We, we hear this message, Jesus is coming soon, the judgment. We hear it in our churches every weekend, don't we? Who have we been preaching to? Come on. Thank you. Have we become the object of our own tithe? And, you know, in, when I was in, um, it was either Romania or Ukraine. I don't remember which, but I said, are we preaching to the choir? And... And that's what, what's called an idiom. It's an expression that's used that, that you and I understand, but they didn't understand in those countries. And, and I had to learn how to speak in those countries and not use any idioms, expressions. But, but I found, but I discovered that what they used will translate anywhere. And it, when I said, are we preaching to the choir? I got stuck. This says, of course we preach to the choir. They're in the church. You're supposed to preach to the choir. <laughs> but they said, are we knocking on doors that are already open? Jesus tells us in Revelation 21, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice, I can't read my own slide there, just a minute. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. Jesus knocks on doors that are not open. If they're already open, it just goes on in, you see, right? Does Jesus have to come around and knock on your door for, for, to come into your heart? You've already accepted him, see? Now, this, this when I read this, it was so interesting. Adventist World. That's a, you, how many of you are familiar with Adventist World magazine? Okay. August uh, 2011. And the Guyana Conference. Guyana is the only English-speaking country in South America. And their president is, at the time was uh, Bharat Jagbeo. It doesn't sound very South American-like, does it? Okay. There's a reason for that. The, the, they were having a, their conference session, and they had invited the president of the country to speak to the, to the conference session attendees. And what he told them was interesting. He said, preaching to the converted once a week won't transform the community. He said, Jesus' life was characterized not just by prayer, but by service. So we need not just to pray in beautiful edifices, but go into the communities where the people are. Now what's interesting, Bharat Jagdeo is not Christian, he's Hindu. <laughs> he's Hindu. He understands the basics of how to reach people with whatever you want to sell them, or whatever you want to motivate them with. If you ran um, a restaurant selling veggie burgers, or, or real burgers, whatever. Uh, how, how, do you want, how do you want to do it so you'll be really rich? Do you want to open a great big restaurant in New York and invite everyone to come buy your burgers? Or do you want to put one in every city, two or three places in the city, a small restaurant, and hire teenagers to work it and high school graduates to run it? That's what you want to do if you want to be rich. Be like McDonald's, parties, etc. They're rich. 
because they know how to reach the people where the people are throughout the world. The people selling hamburgers are smarter in selling burgers than what we have been in doing God's work. Now, I want to, I want to share something with you. The devil has been very clever in getting us to simply focus on the saints and preaching to them. And if you think about just the basic gospel message, like any of our other Protestant churches would share, Baptist, Presbyterian, Methodist, so forth, Jesus saves, accept the gospel of Jesus, just like that. If you take collectively all Christians on all the face of the earth of all denominations have not reached the entire earth in the 2,000 years since Jesus was on earth. Right? Even today, I, I was reading recently, there were, there's 10,000 people groups in the world. 4,000 haven't, haven't had the opportunity to know about Jesus. 4,000 of those people groups. They may be small population people groups, but 4,000 groups, and not us, plus Baptists, plus Presbyterians, plus Methodists, plus the Brethren, etc., have, have been able to do it because the devil, all he had to do is say, okay, if I can take all the ministers, have them preach to all the saints, and make them the object of their own tithe, they'll expect the minister to do all the soul winning, they'll expect him to do all the visiting, attend all the board meetings, and listen to us fight with each other, and all of these other things, and then, since they're salaried and could afford to move around and plant churches in places where we have no churches, they won't be able to do that. And because the members have a pastor, they expect the pastor to do all the work, and everything is on a halt. Do you understand what I'm telling you? It's on a halt. It's on a halt. And you can shoot at me when I leave, but I don't care. <laughs> I've given this world, in many places in the world, but I'm telling you the truth. We are on a halt. And um, if we look and we read, many of you have read writings of Ellen White. What did the early pioneers do? They went place to place to place to place, and they would start up new churches. When they were done, they'd move to the next town and do the same thing until they got off track doing that until they got off track doing that. Ellen White, James, the early pioneers, Loughborough, all those guys, that's what they did. And then Ellen White warned them, don't hover over the churches, don't hover over the churches, don't hover over the churches. And just like Israel, did we obey the prophet? Israel didn't. Israel was delayed 40 years in going into Egypt. We've been delayed closer to 200. There is a reason why the seventh church is called Laodicea. We're Laodicean. We're lukewarm. And I have to, you know, if you feel like I'm slapping you around, I have to slap myself around, okay? No. I have to do that because we are Laodicea. God, God works with the Laodicean church. He has chosen us. He has set us apart as a special, unique group with a last-day warning message that has to go to all the world, including all the other people who are already Christian, because they must know that we are in the time of the judgment. When Jesus comes in the clouds of glory, the decision, saved or lost, has already been made. He doesn't sit up there in the clouds and say, hmm, now let me think about this a minute. No, it's done. And his coming is soon. And, and here's, here's something said. Whether or not we warn the world, some population groups progressively are getting worse and worse and worse and worse. Yes? Like, when I open up my app, my news app, and I read about Louisville, 
Evansville, Chicago, New York, all these places, and all the sin and all the shooting, children shooting in the schools, and so forth and so on, the world is progressively getting worse and worse and worse at a more rapid rate. And just like in, in Jonah's time, they repented at a certain point, but later they were destroyed because they got so wicked to a point that they would not turn back if they were given a chance. And so right now, our job is to reach people while they can still be reached and before they get so sinful that they won't listen to you no matter what. So we have to really get out there quickly so that there is something to save in this people group. And so, whether we get out and warn them or not, that people are going to go past beyond the, the point of no return. They'll be lost forever. And so, we, our job is to save as many as we can. And in so doing, our own spirituality increases. Amen? We draw closer to Jesus, closer and learn more about faith. Amen? Do we then make ourselves more likely to make it to heaven, so to speak, because we draw close to Jesus every day more? Amen. But won't it be a joy to be walking down, walking down the, the streets of gold on one side of the river of life, and you know, it spans both sides of the river, and looking across and see someone pointing at you, and he's got a whole group with him. And he's explaining, that's the man, the woman that told me, and that's why I'm here. But he's got 500 people with him. And you only reached the one, but he reached others, 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 others. No matter what you have to spend, no matter what you have to sacrifice, it's going to be worth it. It's going to be worth it. It's going to be worth it. Don't you forget that. <laughs> okay. Luke 4, 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. This is what Jesus did. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted to preach deliverance to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. Mark 2, 17, when Jesus heard it, he saith unto them, they that are whole have no need of the physician. Do you make an appointment to go to the doctor, you know, just to say hi? No. But they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Your job and my job is to call sinners to repentance. Do you feel out of place or embarrassed or feel like you're unworthy to do it? Many of you may feel that way. You feel like, oh, I can't do that. I'm not trained to do that. Well, you know, how many of you know what OJT means? On the job training? On the job training? Down where, where we are, we were preaching a campaign one time, and there were two young men. And I refused to preach the whole campaign. I wanted those two men, young men to get experience. One of them never went to college. The other one did, but got a, some other kind of degree. They did, and their first sermon sounded like a lot of people's first sermons. But one night, I heard one of them preach the best presentation of that topic I'd ever heard in my life from any living speaking, speaker, and I've attended campaigns by the best. On a different night, the same thing happened with another guy. A couple of years after that, I realized that if I had decided to preach the whole campaign myself because I had the experience, I would have stolen from the Holy Spirit the opportunity to improve those men's talents. And then when I would be called to give this type of seminar to places overseas, I didn't worry about the place. I didn't worry about pulpit coverage. I didn't give them a list of what to do. I just left. I just went. They took over. Now they, they outstrip me in some ways. 
It's called OJT. Great Controversy, page 457 and 458. Now, Great Controversy, much of Great Controversy was, um, was first published in a book called Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, three, Volumes 3 and 4, and that was published in 1884. If I remember, uh, let me just let me just check on that here. I, 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 my vision doesn't extend quite out that far, but um, let's do it this way. There we go. Yeah, in 1884. So 1884, uh, Ellen White would have been 57 years old at this time. Think about that a minute. The history of ancient Israel is a striking illustration of the past experience of the Adventist body. God led his people, even, uh, wait a minute, God led his people in the Advent movement even as he led the children of Israel from Egypt. If all who had labored unitedly in the work of 1844 had received the third angel's message and proclaimed it in the power of the Holy Spirit, the Lord would have wrought mightily with their efforts. A flood of light would have been shed upon the world. Years ago, the inhabitants of the earth would have been warned, the closing work completed, and Christ would have come for the redemption of his people the lady was 57 years old when this was published, and she said, years ago, the inhabitants of the world would have been warned, the closing work completed. When you're almost 60 and you're talking about something that happened years ago, it means a long time. It would have been very close after 1844. And Christ would have come for the redemption of his people. It was not the will of God that Israel should wander 40 years in the wilderness. He desired to lead them directly to the land of Canaan and establish them there, a happy, holy people. But they could not enter in because of unbelief, Hebrews 3.19. Because of their backsliding and apostasy, they perished in the desert, and others were raised up to enter the promised land. In like manner, it was not the will of God that the coming of Christ should be so long delayed 1884. It was not the will of God that the coming of Christ should be so long delayed, and his people should remain so many years in this world of sin and sorrow, but unbelief separated them from God. As they refused to do the work which he had appointed them, others were raised up to proclaim the message. In mercy to the world, Jesus delays his coming that sinners may have an opportunity to hear the warning and find in him a shelter before the wrath of God shall be poured out. Review and Herald, May 27, 1894, I think. Why has the Lord so long delayed his coming? The whole host of heaven is waiting to fulfill the last work for the lost world, and yet the work waits. The whole host of heaven is waiting is waiting to help you. Can you imagine angels are sitting up there saying, but just waiting, they're waiting, they're anxiously waiting. They want to take part, but they can't preach it for you. But they can do everything to open the way and to protect you and to propel you on and to give you help, to, to tell you things, even what to say. You'll hear something in your ear. The whole host of heaven is waiting to help you. You want to have high-level help? Okay. Yet the work waits. It is because the few who profess to have the oil of grace in their vessels with their lamps have not become burning and shining lights in the world. It is because missionaries are few. Evangelism, page 696. For 40 years did unbelief, murmuring, and rebellion shut out the ancient Israel from the land of Canaan. The same sins have delayed the entrance of modern Israel into the heavenly Canaan. In neither case were the promises of God at fault. In the unbelief, the worldliness, unconsecration, and strife among the Lord's professed people that, uh, that have kept us from kept us in this world of sense and sorrow so many years. 
manuscript releases. Uh, okay. This was written in 1901, volume 10. We may have to remain in this world because of insubordination. I don't like that word when it applies to me. We may have to remain in this world because of insubordination many more years, as did the children of Israel. But for Christ's sake, his people should not add sin to sin by charging God with the consequence of their own wrong course of action. It's not God's fault, in other words. It's not his fault that he, had, he hasn't just sort of decided to wait long. No, it's a direct response to us. Now have men who claim to believe the word of God learned that their lesson that obedience is better than sacrifice. Broadside 2, this was a pamphlet written in 1849. I saw that the time for Jesus to be in the most holy place was nearly finished, and that time can last but a very little longer. Oh, mercy. This was the expectation when they were doing things right. But we got off track. First selected messages, page 67. It is true that time has continued longer than we expected in the early days of the message. Our Savior did not appear as soon as we had hoped. But has the word of the Lord failed? Never. It should be remembered that the promises and threatenings of God are alike conditional. We talked about that earlier, you remember. It's conditional. So how many, now here's a question, how many would be lost? Let's just suppose that uh, Pastor Kruger got sick for six, mo six months. He couldn't come, and the conference couldn't send a pastor to speak to you or, or visit you or attend your board meetings. How many of you Saints here would be lost forever, burn in the lake of fire, not go to heaven because of that. Maybe one or two. Not one, right? Not one. Okay. But suppose that every pastor in the Indiana conference was locked up in jail for five years for preaching the gospel. Now, when I spoke in Russia about this, they knew what I was talking about. I talked to one pastor, still remembers the day that his dad was led off to jail. He never saw him again. There was a time when there were, uh, earlier on, when there were not so many pastors in Russia, when there were 200 pastors there and 198 were in jail. But suppose that every um, minister in Indiana, whether it be Lake Region Conference or Indiana Conference, was locked up, five, ten years, whatever. How many of the baptized saints would be lost forever, not, you know, burn in the lake of fire and not go to heaven because of that fact? Not one. Many might be lost, but it wouldn't be because of that. It'd be their own fault. Would you agree? Okay. But how about, how about, how many have been lost in the last five or 10 or 15 years, or in the last two years with all this shooting going on, in areas where we could have made efforts to enter, but didn't? How many of them may have been lost forever, burned the lake of fire, because we didn't get to them in time? We have to admit that number has to be high. It has to be high. General Conference Bulletin, April 14, 1901, paragraph 21. The work of a minister is to minister. Now, some of these are hot quotes, folks. Our ministers are to work on the gospel plan of ministering. It has been presented to me that all through America there are barren fields. As I traveled through the South on my way to the conference, I saw city after city that was unworked. What is the matter? The ministers are hovering over the churches which know the truth while thousands are perishing out of Christ. If the proper instruction were given, if the proper methods were followed, every church member would do his work as a member of the body. He would do Christian missionary work. doesn't mean that all of you have to preach. But you have to do what you're able to do, and that will be different for all of you. And, and then you have to be willing to even try a little more. But the churches are dying, and they want a minister to preach to them. They should be taught to bring a faithful tithe to God, that he may strengthen and bless them. They should be brought into working order, that the breath of God may come to them. 
They should be taught that unless they can stand alone without a minister, they need to be converted anew and baptized anew. They need to be born again. I don't know what to tell at the minister's meeting how they can get more baptisms this year. <laughs> Some of you are smiling with me. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Isn't it sad when, we, when, we're, when we're forced to look at our own reality? It's really sad, isn't it? But we can change it on a moment's notice. We can change it on a moment's notice. We can go to our knees and say, Lord, help me. <clears throat> I, want, I want to challenge you to do something that I've done for several, for a number of years now. And it's this. Every morning when you get up, say, Lord, let it be by the end of the day that at least one or more persons and or one or more entities could be an organization is somehow more in harmony with your will, more enlightened on health, okay, or their lives are better off in, in, in your view. view. <clears throat> could be enlightenment on the Sabbath, could be just uh, learning some other element, could be something health, could be uh, better finances, tithe, whatever. Because I'm on this earth, let not one day be wasted. And every day that I have prayed that, every single day, by the end of the day, I have seen where God has worked in some way, made some divine appointment for me. You know, I turned this way and there was, there was somebody, you know. It has never failed one single day. Do you think that when you give yourself to God in the morning that way that he's going to say, I don't think so? No, he's not going to. He's going to work through your life because you want to be used by Him. You're willing to do something for somebody else so that they're better off in some way. I don't know, maybe pay some lady's light bill. Her husband left her for some sweet thing and you know, she can't pay, pay the light bill. Go down to the light company and pay that woman's light bill. Make her life better. It could even be things like that. But you can do that. And then this one, this one really hurts. When I read this, it was a real double take. Australasian Union Conference Recorder, uh, August 4, 1902. The Australasian Union Conference Recorder is kind of like their union paper, like the Lake Region paper here. Uh, Lake, uh, Lake Union, excuse me. Our ministers are not to hover over the churches regarding the churches in some particular place as their special care. That means no... No church districts. We have two world divisions, however, where ministers are never assigned to churches. It's South Africa, Indian Ocean Division, and South America Division. Not Central America, South America. In those divisions, ministers are assigned to geographic territories in which they are to raise up new churches. An acquaintance of mine in the Indiana Conference here was from the South American division, where in his territory there were 74 churches. Obviously, he didn't pastor all 74 churches, did he? In those churches, they do exactly like the Apostle Paul. They raise up new churches, turn it over to the elders to pastor them. Our ministers are not to hover over the churches regarding the churches in some particular place as their special care, and our churches should not feel jealous and neglected if they do not receive ministerial labor. They should themselves take up the burden and labor most earnestly for souls. You'll fill this church up so fast, you'll have to have double services. Instead of one person who has to drive an hour from someplace else to get here to church and then 30 minutes another place and all like that and try to cover all the territory in between, win all the cells, souls, attend all the board meetings and, and, and preach to all the saints. They don't have any time to do any real ministerial work and start new churches, do they? I know he drives a long way to church because I drove here today. <laughs> okay. Instead of Testimonies Volume 6. Instead of keeping the ministers at work for the churches that already know the truth, let the members of the churches say to these laborers, this is what you're supposed to tell the pastors. Go work for souls that are perishing in darkness. 
We ourselves will carry forward the services of the church. We will keep up the meetings, and by abiding in Christ, we'll maintain spiritual life. That's just a basic request. That's simple. We will work for souls that are about us, and we will send our prayers and our gifts to sustain the laborers in more needy and destitute fields. Foremost among those called to preach the gospel stands the Apostle Paul to every minister, an example of loyalty, devotion, and untiring effort. And we could just go on and on and on. I've got so much more, but I want you to remember what I've given to you. This presentation has a lot more slides, and I don't want to wear you out, but I think I've given you a pretty good bit to think about. I'm going to go through a few and then just see if there's something else that I feel that I need to share, because if I had to go through everything left, I'm afraid that uh, um, you'd be glad to see me go. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yes. Um, wait a minute. I may have one back in my briefcase there. Uh, oh, I will... Um, I will share with you something else, though, here. We're going to go to... Um, I will go a little bit further, okay? Here, talking about Paul's experiences, Romans 15. This is what Paul himself, what he said, what he did, how he acted... I want to go a little bit further with you. I, this, is, this is important, so uh, trust me on this, folks, if you will, if you'll tolerate me a little longer. Yea, so I have strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named. Question, is the Apostle Paul supposed to be the model for the, the modern minister? He's supposed to be the model, yes. Not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. In other words, when one pastor leaves, you're not supposed to be searching for another one to fill his shoes. Okay? But as it is written, to whom he was not spoken of, they shall see. And they that have not heard shall understand, for which cause I have been much hindered from coming to you. Romans 10, verses 13, 14. For whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent, not retained? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah, Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report. Galatians 3, verse 8, And the Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. Now, <clears throat> there is an important passage here in Acts. Paul is going back to Jerusalem. He stops at Miletus and he calls for the elders from Ephesus. He wants to speak to them. And he's going to give them instructions. And he said, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Now, who is it that has designated the elders to be the overseers? Who does it say? The Holy Ghost. Okay. The Holy Spirit himself has designated the elders to be the overseers of the church of God. Okay. Is it wise to go against the Holy Spirit? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. 
Well then, who, what, what does this term, over, what is overseers? What does this literally mean? 1 Peter, uh, one, uh, First Peter 5, uh, <clears throat> feed, talk, Peter is talking to the elders. He says, feed the flock of God, which is among you, taking oversight, there's that word oversee, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a freed mind. In Ephesians 4, it tells us he gave some to be apostles and prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints under the work of ministering under the building up of the body of Christ. What is that word pastors there? What are, that's, it's only used one time in all of the New Testament, the word pastors, only once. So pastors there literally means... It's poimenas, that's the word. It means herdsmen or shepherds, the overseers of the Christian assemblies. And the Holy Ghost has said that those people are the elders. And so, literally what it's saying, he gave some to be apostles. That's like the folks we call pastors. Their real title is minister. You've never heard of the term minister, you know, you've heard the term minister of the gospel, but you've never heard the term pastor of the gospel, have you? Okay? Some to be apostles, that would be like your, your past, you know, the people you've called pastors all this time. Some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints under the work of ministering, under the building up of the body of Christ. Remember in Greek that there's no... Original Greek, there's no punctuation. So to help us understand that better, I dropped out a couple of commas there. Now it makes more sense. And he gave some to be apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. Can we get away with that? Yeah, actually we can. Because remember when Christ was on the cross, how we moved the commas around there? You remember that? Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto you, Today shalt thou be with me, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. We move the comma. Okay, if we can move the comma there, we can move the comma elsewhere. If it goes along with the rest of Scripture, and I'm going to skip past that because you know that one all too well. There we go. Okay. Review and Herald, June 25, 1895. If people would minister to other souls who need their help, they would themselves be ministered unto by the chief shepherd. And thousands would be rejoicing in the fold who are now wandering in the desert. When you step forward to reach out to others who need to hear what you already know, you have the Holy Spirit, the chief shepherd, Jesus, as your pastor. And thousands and thousands of angels are waiting to help you. And so where did the idea of a settled pastor come from? When we were back in Pennsylvania, head deacon in one of my church, he grew up in the Catholic church, he was an altar boy. He, he said, somehow I think it must be something Catholic. Here you go, from the Catholic Encyclopedia. The Catholic Encyclopedia. Give me a moment here. Because i got to get to it here because, I, okay. Satan's plan, this is taken from the Catholic Encyclopedia. The term, it says pastor. This term denotes a priest who has the cure of souls, that is, who is bound in virtue of his office to promote the spiritual welfare of the faithful by preaching. The Council of Trent, this is back in the days of Luther, the very end of the, there was like 20 some odd, this is toward the very end of the, of, the, of, the, uh, of the period of time in the Reformation. The Council of Trent, session 24, shows it to mean the mind of the church that dioceses, that's like a conference, wherever possible should be divided into canonical parishes. A canonical parish is like a church district. And then it says, pastors, besides having rights, have also obligations. They must preach and take care of the religious instruction of the faithful. There's nothing, there's nothing in here about 
reaching out into other towns and making sure everybody knows. There's nothing about going into every nation, kindred, tongue type of people here, is there? There's nothing about evangelism here. And so what has happened <clears throat> when, during the Reformation, when Protestantism separated off from Catholicism, they separated on the issue of righteousness by faith, how we're saved. We're not confessing to the priests. The issue of, the, you know, who's the pastor was, wasn't a big issue right then, okay? And so they just followed along. They didn't know anything that was wrong with that idea. But when God had a remnant church, a remnant church, that he was going to task with preaching the final last message to the earth of the three angels' messages, which we're studying now in our Sabbath school lessons. When he gave us as a unique, separate, denominated people that job, he gave us the original method of ministry as well. And when Ellen White and her compatriots were following it, our growth was rapid. But little by little, for whatever reasons, we slacked off and started following the same model as the other churches, which got it from Catholicism. That's how this method has gone. And this is when she was written in Australia. The cities in America and this country and other countries are not worked as they should be, and yet we are admonished to be laborers together with God. Instead of this, many churches collectively and individually have been so far removed from God, so separated from His Spirit that they have left souls to perish all around them while they've been calling for workers to labor in the church. This labor has been granted them, and the impenitent and the sinner have been robbed of the messages which the Lord would have given to them. The earth is about 240,000 miles away. If you, get, if you were in a, a rocket going 1,000 miles an hour, it'd take about 10 days to get there. 1,000 miles times 24 hours, that's 24,000. That's 240,000, take about 10 days. But the population of the earth is about 7.8 billion. And if you were to line those people up every three feet, one person, the line would take 185 and a half days to fly past at 1,000 miles an hour and just wave at them. Can you see that we're up against an impossible task? It's a task that you and I cannot do. God is asking us to do something that we can't do. You can't save yourself, can you? Have you learned that you can't be your own righteousness? You've learned that. It all requires help from above. It requires angels and God and, and everything all involved in it to give you the power. So when God asks us to do this, expects us to do this, commands us to do this before he will return, he's asking us to do something none of you can do. All of us together can't do it. But when we go out to do that which we know is impossible, Thousands and ten thousands of angels who are now waiting line up. If you look at the total number of pastoral and evangelistic evangelism employees, 2021, it was 34,000. And standing one every three feet, that line is about 19 miles long. So you see, we've got an impossible task, okay? And, but here you go. I, I want to close on this quote, okay? In that, and uh, Testimonies for the Church, Volume 9, page 129. In working for perishing souls, you have the companionship of angels. Thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000 angels are waiting to cooperate with members of our churches in communicating the light that God has generously given, that a people may be prepared for the coming of Christ. I'm going to make a call. You don't have to come to the front unless you want to. But I, but I expect you to at least raise your hands, and some of you, that's the best you can do. 
How many of you are willing, on the basis of what is so clearly evident, that you're willing to do what you can? Day by day, ask for God to work through you so that by the end of the day, someone is better off because you're here. You ask for that. And God will help it to happen. How many of you are willing to seriously study into the issue of telling the pastors, go work for souls in darkness. We ourselves will keep up the meetings of the church. You know, I, I listened to the Sabbath school this morning. I, I thought it was pretty good. I think your leadership in this church are pretty capable. You strike me as that way. If you've got enough to gather, if you've got it together enough to build a beautiful place like this, this means that you can work together. This means that you can do stuff together. <clears throat> This means that you can even put your young people, your, your kids, up to preach. My 18-year-old grandson's going to be preaching soon. <laughs> and his two younger brothers, they take off for offering just like their deacons. You know, the, the pathfinders do that. If they can do that, how many of you are willing to, to give this your support because we're told to do it? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are weak. <clears throat> we are errant. We are sinners. We have sinned in not doing what you've commanded us to do, to reach out to people that we're acquainted with, even. So, Lord, take us now. We confess. Help us to repent and make this right and go forward with your help in our different ways, whatever we can do, so that by the end of the day, Somehow, this world is a better place because of you working through us, because of you giving power that we don't have, because you sending angels to help us to do it. Lord, help us. Help us to hasten the return of Jesus. We thank you. Ask this all to be your will in Jesus' name. Amen. Remember, go to letmypastorsgo.com, and you can find, um, for those of you who are not Internet savvy, there's also some, some, some actual books. And uh, how many of you really, and it's free that way. I intentionally made it free to the world, to the world church, because I couldn't bear for someone in some poverty-stricken country not being able to buy the book. The original version of the book is on the General Conference Youth Department website under a different title. But uh, Gary Blanchard, the world youth director, says, Wes, you've got to get a different title. But uh, go there. And, but how many of you really just can't deal with the Internet at all but would like to have a copy? You just can't deal with the Internet to, to look this up and would like to have an actual physical copy? I'll give it to you today if, if, this, is, if this is you. I see no hands up. I see, okay. I owe you a copy. All right? Thank you so much. Our closing song is a three Far and near to the field of the for the state of the
with lost birds being in sin, moving in the noon tides When the sun's last rays are streaming, with him But we must hear a song to the refrain. Then and now the sheaves to gather, and the harvest time pass by. Oh, the moon I roll is sending gather now. The sheaves of gold Now we're then And the ding, ding, ding Now shall come With joy untold Lord of harvest Say that we Those here With soul To me we cry Then and now The sheaves together Father in heaven be with us now as we depart may today be a new day may this be a day of change May this day be a day of congregation-wide evangelists in some way, shape, or fashion making a difference in the world. Lord, may there be churches that would spring up around us in the town surrounding here as well. May this church be filled to the brim. I ask this in all of it be well in Jesus' name. Amen.